Okay, so um, yeah, like I said, I want to talk today a little bit about um, this topic of meaningness uh, and, and meditate on meaningness. And, and meaningness is, um, this is a phrase that was developed by a fellow named David Chapman. Um, and, and to connect David to this larger investigation of integral uh, metadharma, I think would be, would be helpful. Because um, the first book that I ever read of Ken Wilber's, I think I was maybe 18 or 19 at the time, I picked up uh, this book that had recently come out called Boomeritis. And, and this was uh, Ken's attempt at a postmodern novel. Um, so he, he, in the novel, there's this character who is a PhD student at MIT in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And this, this person, this, uh, this character, is going through a kind of existential and intellectual crisis where they're really mm -hmm. starting to question a lot about the nature of reality, spirituality, meaning-making, all of these things. And this character ends up becoming kind of a mouthpiece for Wilbur's integral theory. Uh, and, and for me, somehow I found this to be a compelling introduction to his work, enough that I read more books. Um, but I later found out, uh, after I had met this interesting character named David Chapman um, uh, through Buddhist Geeks, uh, that he believes and has a, a lot of evidence to support the, the, the belief that he was actually the inspiration for that character in, in Ken's book. Um, because in, 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 at around the same time that Ken was researching this and coming around MIT and talking to professors, talking to his professors, uh, David was a PhD student in artificial intelligence at MIT. Um, very interestingly, David also ended up going on after his program to, um, to help co-found a company along with Richard Feynman, who was the sort of uh, famous Nobel Prize winning physicist. And they ended up, that company created the first neural networks, the first neural nets, which are now a really important part of kind of modern AI. Um, so David, you know, to say that he has a, a, a sharp mind is, is definitely an understatement. Um, and, but after that, he pivoted toward kind of more philosophy and practice, and Buddhist practice in particular, Tantra, even more specifically. Um, and he spent, it seems like the last, as long as I've known him, he's been, he's been kind of slowly working on this project called Meaningness, uh, an attempt to understand meaning making and meaning itself. And um, he's got a great website called meaningness.com. He's working on a book, but it's been sort of a slow kind of development of, of articles and linking them together and slowly sort of building this kind of, this uh, sort of uh, philosophical approach. And um, one of the core kind of goals of meaningness, as, as I understand it, is to really start to question two very common stances that we take as human beings in relation to meaning. And these are the stances of eternalism and of nihilism or nihilism, um, depending on how you like to say it. Um, and, and, and the basic notion here of eternalism, this is how David describes it, says eternalism says that everything has a def definite true meaning. That's the stance of eternalism. Uh, and then the stance of nihilism says that nothing really means anything. Um, I'm sure you all probably recognize both of these stances, you know, uh, probably from the inside. I'm sure we all go through times and periods where we're more eternalistic. You know, we have a more of a sense of absolute certainty that there's this definite true meaning to life and that, you know, we understand that meaning. Um, or, and, and other times we have this sort of definite, clear understanding that nothing really means anything. And it's very clear to us that this is true. Um, I think what's interesting about both of these positions is that they both, what they have in common is that, they, that they, there's certainty. There is certainty that things mean that there is this definite meaning or that there's definitely no meaning. Um, and of course, and as David points out, uh, it's not really um, workable to hold either of these stances. It's that both of them are contradictory. They don't actually make any sense intellectually and they don't actually play out well in the world. You know, when we become uh, eternalists and we see definite meaning everywhere we look, we start to, um, you know, we project a lot of things into the world that aren't there. 
uh, and uh, we end up really having a kind of delusional relationship to life because we're seeing things, you know, that that, that aren't necessarily there. Um, and, and and likewise, that when we become a nihilist and we we we're in that stance, you know, um, and we're unwilling to acknowledge um, patterns of meaning in our life, uh, and we're 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 just sort of clear that there is no meaning. Um, th- this also causes all kinds of problems, not the least of which is depression and um, you know, hopelessness and despair. Um, really makes it hard to, to, to have a, a good reason for living, you know, if we're really caught in that stance. And likewise with eternalism, we're really caught in that stance. It makes it really hard to accept suffering and understand people's suffering and, and or be able to relate to others who don't share the same conviction that we do about how, about what the, the meaning of life is and where it derives from. Um, and, and what, what David kind of points out in his work is that we fall into either of these stances when we don't have a good understanding of the nature of what he calls nebulosity and pattern when we don't see that both of these things are always at play in our meaning making. Um, And here David really describes nebulosity. He says it means cloud likeness, cloud likeness. And, And he said nebulosity refers to the intangible, transient, amorphous, non separable, ambiguous nature of meaningness. So, so what he's positing here is that there is nebulosity, um, that when we try to understand things often, um, we can't fully understand them. We can't fully grok things all the time. There's, there's a point at which our clear distinctions break down and there's sort of this ambiguousness, this lack of clarity, like with a cloud. You know, the, the cloud is kind of, it has a shape, but it's constantly changing and moving. And if you zoom in on the cloud, you know, suddenly your experience of the cloud changes. Uh, you, you go from seeing this kind of white pattern with like blue in the background to suddenly you're seeing just kind of like this more amorphous misty grayness. You know, if, you're, if you've had the experience of flying through a cloud, it's like there's just a sense of being in this thing that's kind of changing, but we don't know what it is. Uh, I like this analogy for nebulosity. It's like that it, ha- it has that kind of feeling when we when we uh, when we approach something that's nebulous. It's like we don't really know exactly what this is. Um, um, but likewise, uh, just as there is nebulosity, according to David and and his work on meaningness, so too there is pattern. Um, he writes, meanings are also more or less patterned, um, reliable distinct, enduring, clear, and definite. So um, it's not just that everything is nebulous. There actually are patterns that we can recognize, that, do, that we can actually recognize. There are things that endure, um, that are um, bigger than us, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the pattern of the mountains here in Appalachia, these are, this, this, the pattern of these mountains, even though it's changing and it's, it's nebulous, in some ways, it's also a billion year old pattern. Um, and so it's not that these mountains are just totally nebulous, like they actually, they actually exist, I can see them. You know, I've walked in them, I've hiked in them, I know, you know, I know these mountains, I know that there is a pattern to them, I know some of the ways in which they, they go up and down. They're nebulous, but they're changing at such a slow rate that from my point of view, they seem pretty enduring and seem pretty clear. Um, and so we have this sort of, um, both andness to nebulosity and to pattern that it's um, both of these things are true. And, and where we get in trouble, as David says, is um, when we don't recognize that both are true and they're both simultaneously true. There's both pattern and nebulosity always at play. Um, and so when we kind of um, reify pattern, you could say, then we find ourselves in the eternalist stance. Nothing really, you know, everything has this definite meaning and it's patterned this way. Um, And then we can't really acknowledge the nebulosity 
and, and, and the places where that where idea of what 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 is breaks down. And likewise with with nebulosity, um, if we reify that and we think, oh, it's just there is no pattern whatsoever. There's just this nebulous experience that has no meaning. Well, just even listening to that, you know, uh, nihilism says that nothing really means anything. That's a pattern. <laughs> we've taken this experience of nebulosity, of amorphousness, and we've made it a definite pattern. You know, so it contradicts itself right there immediately. Um, and so, so this is kind of the embarrassing thing. Um, here, Dave, the last thing I'll share on this, David writes, Nebul nebulosity and pattern might seem to contradict each other, but almost always they come together. Meaning is usually nebulous to some extent and patterned to some extent. It can be hard, he writes, to accept that meaningness is a matter of degree, not either or. This book is about the confusions that come from assuming meaning must be either totally patterned or entirely non-existent. So that's what the project of meaningness is sort of fundamentally about. Um, and what I love about this is what he kind of hypothesizes, you know, is possible when we begin to become more comfortable with the both endness of pattern and nebulosity, of not getting stuck uh, so much in either the stance of eternalism or the stance of nihilism. Um, he calls this the emergence of, of the fluid mode. You know, a fluid mode of being in which we can um, both recognize pattern and let it go um, to kind of take this, what he calls a meta-rational uh, view uh, or a meta-systematic view on things and, and have more of a capacity to do that in, in a fluid and ongoing way. Um, and I think that's maybe another way, a different way, uh, similar way to describing I think what Wilbur's work is about with with integral theory you know this ability to pick up models and to see models but to also recognize that no model is complete um, you know but but to also see that you know if we pick up models we we can learn from them we can be inside of them we can see what they're about we can release them and let them go you know we can we can engage with the pattern and then we can release in, into the nebulosity um, that by doing this, by continually going in and out of pattern and nebulosity, we start to kind of tune into and pick up on even deeper patterns, even deeper nebulosity, you know, that's present. And it's, it's kind of a, a, a journey. The fluid mode is a journey into greater understanding and greater letting go uh, of understanding, um, as I <laughs> sort of understand it. <laughs>